We have a new episode of Legends and Leaders, and today it's great to have Harvey here. Harvey, you're the CEO of the Recording Academy. It's an incredible organization that really is, you know, has brought a lot of uh, a lot of recognition to people and uh, really uh, bestowed upon them achievement and recognition for that achievement. Uh, and that's something that I think is now under your leadership and expanded to so many different types of people that maybe would not have been done before, um, which is you know great to be aware of that. Um, and also, it's it's good to just be leading something like this that really cares about awarding people for doing good and for bringing positivity to the world. And you've also worked on you know, standing up for a lot of causes that you care about personally, um, whether that's you know being involved in the Cancer Society, the American Cancer Society, and other charities too. I think you've been a great role model for people um, in the music space. So I'm excited to have you here and to get into your story. Well, thank you, Ben. All that uh, setup makes me sound kind of good. <laughs> <laughs> that's the goal. So... Early on, Harvey, how did your passion for music begin? What inspired you to want to be a producer, a writer, and get into the space? Well, it was pretty straightforward because I grew up in a musical household. My parents were both really talented musicians. My dad played drums and was a songwriter and a producer. My mom was actually a trombone player, if you can imagine that. And my folks actually met in college in music school in Berkeley in Boston. So uh, it was kind of in my DNA. It was in my blood. I had instruments in my house at all times i was playing the piano from before i could walk you know, i'd crawl up to the piano and i'd reach up and try and plunk out notes uh, so it was just part of growing up and i loved watching my parents make music i love watching my dad practice uh, i didn't like practicing myself so much but i just loved writing and creating on the piano as i got a little bit older and the passion for it was almost built in and i was indoctrinated obviously in a very musical household, lots of different genres, listening to rock and country and pop and jazz and R&B and then at some point rap. So it's just a great household to grow up in and a great opportunity to ingest so much music and just have it be a part of, of who I was as a kid. And I kind of thought it was natural. I thought everyone wrote songs and played instruments. You know, my, I didn't see all my friends doing it, but I'm sure everyone in my house was playing music. So that's how I got started. So how did you start to develop your own kind of songwriting styles and production skills? Like what, what kind of inspired you to put, to put your own, to build up your own skills and your own way of creating music? What inspired me was other people that I respected. One of them being my dad and then the musicians that he was around, you know, he was making a lot of records and playing sessions every day. He was doing three, two, three records a day. When I was young, he'd go from studio to studio playing with different artists. And in the summer I would a lot of times go with him. And at some point, I actually was doing cartage for my dad, loading his drums into a van and setting him up. So I was just in studios, and I was around incredibly talented people. And early in my life, I got to meet Quincy Jones and <laughs> spent some time at sessions that he was producing. And I said, that's the guy I want to be. I want to do what he does. And I knew I wasn't going to go on the road and play you know, guitar or piano, although I did play piano for some some touring musicians i knew i didn't want to just engineer or just write songs and i definitely didn't have the skill to be an artist but when i saw quincy conducting all the pieces and bringing in the right musicians to play together and what did that sound like and working on even the budgeting process and just everything that went into making a record that inspired me and that excited me about it. So that was really my first introduction into what production was and what got me started. As far as developing my own sound, it was really amalgamation, a combination of a lot of different people that I respected, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, LA Babyface, um, you know, Devante from, from Jodeci, Teddy Riley, and then other pop music producers, you know, Giorgio Moroder, even a dance, you know, there's a lot of different music that I grew up listening to. And then, of course, my dad was a producer. So I kind of developed my own sound as a mixture of all the things that I had listened to and growing up, uh, you know, consuming. And then topics and conceptually, when I'm writing songs, I generally tend to believe, and I still believe this, that if you're writing from some experience or writing from your heart or you know, a place of feeling and emotion, that you'll tend to come out a little better and resonate with consumers. And so what I chose to write about was generally something that I was experiencing in my life or someone around me was experiencing and there were real 
life lessons, life stories, or emotions that were happening. So that's kind of how I came up with the music. I came up with the concepts and the lyrics behind some of my productions. Not all of them, but many. So you were able to come up and craft your own sound and figure out the direction that you want to go in. How did you start to break into the industry and create your own songs and songs that would start to gain traction? I hustled like crazy. You know, I was writing every day. I was learning. I was trying to collaborate with as many people. I was networking. I was sneaking into concerts. I was, you know, tiptoeing into studios through lounges. I was doing fake food deliveries, you know, all the stuff that you can imagine some young, crazy, troublemaking kid doing. I did it. I was famous for following people from their office to their house so I could learn where the executives from the labels lived and then I could put music in their mailbox. I was always trying to offer things to artists. I remember one concert we went to and understanding that artists would come to concerts in a different city than their own, obviously in part of a tour, I would wait backstage and I'd offer to take them to the mall. You know, for some reason every artist when they're on tour after <laughs> sound check wants to go to the mall. So I'll take him to the mall, and then, of course, when I'm driving back from the mall, after I become friendly with him, I'm going to play in my demo. So these are some of the crazy things that I was doing to make sure people heard my music. But before I did any of that, I really tried. I hope that I worked really hard to perfect my craft and get really good at making music that was competitive. You know, you don't think of music as being competitive, but it's it's almost not that unlike sports where there's so many people competing to be in a few number of spots that you have to be great. You have to sacrifice, you have to practice, you have to get enough touches so that when you're making the music you're making or playing the sport that you're playing, it's better than at least a large percentage of other people that are doing it. So I spent a lot of time before all the hustle started, before any success came, making sure that I was competitive and the songs that I was making and the production that I was putting on tape sounded as good, if not better, than what I was hearing at that time on the radio. You, you were willing to go pretty far. I mean, following execu- following to figure out where executives were, I mean, you, you were willing to give, give it your all. I was a little crazy, for sure, and probably would get in a lot of trouble for doing some of the things I did now, you know, climbing fences and throwing music in the backseat of people's convertibles. And, yeah, I did a lot of crazy stuff. But at that time, there was not an Internet. There was not social media. There was not ways to access. And there were gatekeepers, and there were people that determined who got the opportunity. And if you could somehow crack the code to getting in gratiated with them or in some kind of a relationship with them or let them be aware of you, then you could make your way through the gates. So it's a bit different now. You know, having the ability to email somebody or say, just, hey, listen to my song or just post your own songs and release your own music. The technology has allowed that process to change and made it more accessible for a lot more people. But it was not that way uh, when I started for sure. <laughs> So kind of fast forwarding a little bit, you were able to, you had this like label you were involved with, the underdogs, or this, you know, this um, label, and you were were signed to BMG through Clive Davis. Why do you think that Clive Davis gave you that opportunity? And why was that such a great opportunity for you to really get some incredible hits out of that? Well, the underdogs started as a production company. It was myself and another person that came together, uh, Damon Thomas, to write songs. That's really why we came together, was just as songwriters. I remember we did a session in my garage. The song turned out incredibly well, and immediately a bunch of artists and labels wanted that one song. So the underdogs were born as a result of that first creation, and we didn't have any business name, no bank account. We were just two guys writing music, doing what we loved. And Clive Davis was a big part of the formation of the underdogs because he wanted that first song for one of his artists. And uh, he offered us a a deal for the song. And we both looked at each other like, okay, that sounds great. There's obviously many other steps that went into it. But once we came to that point where we needed to do a deal, we don't have a name. We don't have, you know, any entity to put the check. We we can't even cash the check. So (laughs) the underdogs as a production duo started. We then began signing other writers to help us. Uh, you know, continue to create more and better music. And we worked with some incredibly talented people as part of the underdogs, and we would sign them as producers and writers. And then ultimately, to your point, Clive Davis did give us a label deal, which allowed us to sign our own artists and write songs for our own artists that would then be released through J Records. So a lot of history with Clive for many, many years. Even before we were the underdogs, I was working with Clive uh, on artists that he had signed. So it it was an honor to get to do that underdog label deal with Clive. 
there were some incredible songs that came out of that. Like No Air was a huge hit. There were a bunch of others too. So that was, a, I think it was a, a major shift in music as well and the type of music that was coming out because of that deal. Yeah. Well, we were right on the time when R&B was going through a really exciting period and we were hopefully some small part of that, tiny part of that was, you know, making music that expressed real emotions, really talking about relationships, feelings, interactions, and then also integrating musical changes, chord progressions, bridges, uh, cool synth lines. All those things were part of R&B and pop music at the time. So I feel like I was really fortunate to come up in that, in that really exciting time. Definitely. So why did you want to make Harvey Mason Media? You know, why, why build this company that encompassed everything you were doing? It was an opportunity to expand and do more. I wanted to work in film and television. I didn't want to be constrained to just doing songs or albums or records. Uh, so Harvey Mason Media gave us the chance to reach out and extend tentacles in other industries. You know, we a lot of digital, social media, tech, gaming, other things that we wanted to adventure into. But specifically, uh, we ended up doing a lot of music for film, film projects. It started with Dream Girls and then from there, it kind of went on to some other really fun and exciting music-based programs and shows. And then we wanted to develop content. We wanted to produce films and TV shows, all of which I'm excited to say we've been doing over the last you know, six, eight years. So that was why we initially uh, initially started Harvey Mason Media. Mm -hmm. So you know, because of some of the success that you had and the impact that you had on the music industry, there was the opportunity to become the CEO of the Recording Academy. Can you just talk a little bit about why you wanted to be involved in the Recording Academy in such an important leadership position and how that opportunity even happened? Sure. I was a member of the Recording Academy because I wanted to vote for myself to win a Grammy. Quite honestly, that's how I became a member. <laughs> and then once I was a member, I saw everything that it did, all the important work that it did beyond just giving away the trophies. And once I was aware of that, I said, you know, I want to do more of this. Of course, I want to win a Grammy and I want to keep voting for myself, but I wanted to do the work. And so I ran for Los Angeles governor for the chapter in Los Angeles. And then I went ahead and ran for national trustee and I was elected there. And then from that position, I was encouraged to run for chair of the board. And I was elected as the chair, uh, very thankfully. And as chair, I really loved trying to innovate and trying to move the academy forward. I saw the great work that the academy did. I saw the advocacy and the education and the work at the museum and the music cares and all the things that we were doing really, really well. And of course, amplifying and celebrating music creators with you know our stage and the performances and the shows and the, and the statuettes. But I thought there was a lot of room for more. As a creator, as somebody who knows what it is to be in our industry, I felt like we could do more to serve and support music people. And I felt we could continue to expand our reach and our mission and our scope of everything that the Academy was doing. And so uh, there was an opportunity to become the CEO. I was asked to be the CEO. And after a lot of conversations with my wife, who was uh, very generous and, and gave me the green light, gave me the blessing, I accepted the role about uh, four years ago almost now. And I'm really proud of what we've done. I'm really pleased with the Academy. I think we've got still a lot of work to do, but uh, the changes that have happened, the evolution uh, over the last four years to me puts us in a place where, again, I feel good about it. I'm optimistic and I know the power of the Academy. I know the platform that the Grammys provides us and music and what it can do around the world. And that's what charges me. That's what gets me excited. What can we do through music? How can we utilize the Recording Academy and the Grammys to do good around the world, not just in the music community, but broader, you know, different things are happening in other parts of the world that uh, music can play a role in and the Academy can have a hand in. So this is why I'm excited about the Academy. This is why I wake up pushing forward with the Grammys and trying to continue to iterate on what it is we do, what we've done and how can we do more. Mm -hmm. So you've had some initial goals that you, you set out to do. Um, one of which was focusing on, I think, expanding the musical genres that the organization recognizes for awards. Can you just talk a little bit about, you know, what, how you determine what kind of musical genres to expand to and, you know, which, why did you want to give recognition to some of these different types of genres? The Academy has always given recognition to a wide variety of genres. So it was not really my intent to try and give more awards. It was to make sure that 
every different genre and every different type of creator had a voice in the academy and felt represented in the academy. So we had given away 94, 95 awards, even more before I got it. I think at one point we were up to over 100 awards. Now we're sitting at right around 94 awards, but I believe that the creators of some of the genres that maybe previously felt like they weren't being accurately represented or reflected in the academy are feeling better. Again, still a lot more work to do around making sure all creators, no matter what genre you're from, whether you're at a label, you're independent, whether you're black, you're white, what kind of instrument you play, we want to make sure that the academy is a home to you and you get benefit out of being a part of the academy and the academy can help lift you. But what we focused on over the years has changed how we do that. And of course, there has been some adjustments to the awards. Or there's been adjustments to the categories, just the nomenclature, how we talk about music, we, how we bring members into our academy. Again, thinking about representation, thinking about making sure all different sectors of the industry and genres are being represented. You know, we didn't have the right balance in our membership uh, five or so years ago. We were heavy in one genre of music. We were heavy in the gender. We were somewhat out of skew on, on you know race. So we have a much more reflective membership over the last four or five years. Uh, just in the last three years, we've added 2,500 new women. Uh, we've added people of color to really balance out that that ratio that we need to make sure we're representative there. And we've gone into genres uh, that felt like we weren't getting the right uh, attention. We weren't getting the right results in our, our nominations and our wins, and we weren't serving certain genres of music. So we specifically, rather than just kind of wait and see who applied to be members, we've now gone into the different communities and reached out to the constituents and said, hey, we need you. If we don't have you in you know, rock or country or classical or jazz, we're not going to be, we're not going to be right. We're not going to get the nominations right. We're not going to know what the issues and problems that your community is facing so we can help, so we can address them. So we've done a lot of outreach. We've done a lot of change. As you acknowledge, we've evolved a lot of what we've done at the Academy, including the awards, but even more importantly, the representation, the membership and everything, everything. I mean, literally almost everything. I'm trying to think of something that doesn't it all stems from membership. The membership votes on who gets nominated and who wins, and that's it. It's a direct vote. There's two rounds. The membership decides who our elected leadership is, who is on our, in our boardroom. The membership decides what are the genres and categories and how are we talking about them? What are the, what are the metrics and measurements around how we define a, a genre? So it all stems from getting the right membership, and we're on our way to that. Good to hear there's been some progress in the direction that you want. So you have like a, you added this like songwriters and composers wing, you know, what's been the impact overall on the Academy after having this wing included? Well, I am a songwriter and composer, so it was logical and natural. There was a gap. We were not representing or servicing quite a few people and, and the songwriting and composing communities. It's vast. So the impact, I believe, is hearing again from a, a class of creators that was not being reflected or represented as loudly and as presently as it should. Now with the Songwriters and Composers Wing, we're having events, we're hearing, we're having listening sessions, we're bringing that group together to, to inform us, hey, what can we be doing better? Advocacy-wise, you know, making sure that we're setting up opportunities and pipelines for songwriters and composers. And then also, it's set it up so that we can now honor uh, that group and make sure that they're included in, in everything that we do. So it's been really beneficial. I think it's been extremely impactful. You know, we also have the producers and engineers wing. So there's these wings. We have the Black Music Collective. These wings are specifically giving us input and insight into what's going on in that small group, maybe not small, but that group of music creators so that we can react and we can be, um, we can be reactive to the needs of those communities. If we don't have that input, we're just kind of cruising along doing what we do. So we've done a lot. It's not just been the songwriters and composers. It's, there's been affinity groups within our organization that we're reaching into. We just had a, a Jewish music listening session. We just had a classical music listening session. We had a dance and EDM music listening session so that we can understand what's happening. What are we missing as an academy? What can we do better? How can we serve your group? How can we reflect and honor the people that make music from your group uh, more accurately, more relevant? It is interesting because music comes from so many different types of ethnicities and 
races. And so being more aware of who's having those people shaping the decisions to help war those people you know, can be helpful for sure. Yeah. So, Harvey, if somebody wants to go and win a Grammy and they want to get you know a Grammy award, what would you say are some of the steps that they should be taking to put themselves in that type of position? First step, make something amazing. <laughs> There's no other steps besides that. Make sure that what you're creating is you know, it's special, it's unique, it's honest, it's true, and it's got to have a resonance to it. It's got to land with consumers. How do you do that? I don't have the answer for that. I did it for many years and continue to do it now as a songwriter and a producer, and it's what we wake up dreaming about. How do we create something that moves people, that makes people feel something? Mm -hmm. So that's the first step. The second step is you got to make sure that there's an awareness about your music and that's hopefully happening on the platforms and maybe in some cases at radio and other, other places where consumers are taking in their, their music, but that's not necessarily usually something you can control. Uh, being involved with the Academy and, and being a member to me, I, I feel it can be helpful just because you understand who the Academy members are. You understand what the Academy is about and hopefully you're serving the Academy in more ways than just submitting your song for consideration but there are no specific steps that go into getting a nomination it's a direct vote it's eleven thousand plus voters of our members that listen to the music and i believe strongly that we have a great voting body that does the work they're diligent they listen they're judging the work on its merits they're not considering you know past work or popularity or who's got friends making music, or, you know, there's so many things that can go into a subjective evaluation, but our voters are listening. So they listen to the music and then they vote for what they believe is excellent. So it really starts with the first step, creating something that's excellent and something that, that resonates with the voters. So speaking of excellence, there was an award that you won, the Spirit of Excellence Award. Um, what, what did that mean to you to win that, be, you know, and to be, I mean, because... Philanthropy has been such an important aspect of what you've been doing. What, what did that mean to win an award for those types of efforts? Well, I'm generally not a big award awards guy, you know, which sounds funny coming from the head of the Grammys, but I do want a Grammy. Just let me put that on record because I've been nominated five times and have not won. Uh, but generally it's, it's kind of humbling and it's a bit odd to win awards for doing things that I think, uh, first of all, I love doing, but also I think it's a responsibility for us to do people in positions where we can give back and make a difference should be. So winning a Spirit of Excellence Award almost seems unnecessary, but very, very appreciated. You know, I'm honored when somebody thinks I've done something right. I'm honored when I am acknowledged for making a difference because I love that and I wake up thinking about how I can do it. How can I make the world better? How can I make our music community better? How can I make the lives of others better? And that goes for everyone, my family, the people that work for me, uh, you know, the people that I interact with on a daily basis just walking down the street. I think that's fun. I think that's exciting. So receiving an honor for that is definitely sometimes a bit clumsy, but I'm thankful. I'm respectful for the people that have given me those, those awards. And generally, I, I try and remember that it's not really me that's doing the work. It's a large group of people. You would be surprised if you saw the team that's around me, that does this work, that believes in the work that we're doing, that contributes to it and, and puts me in the position so that I can do a lot of it. But uh, I'm, I'm humbled and I'm honored when I'm, I'm given an award. I mean, you've been involved in multiple different charity efforts, Los Angeles Children's Hospital, the American Cancer Society, through the Grammys, you've been trying to be, you know, have that impact. So it just seems it's something that you really care about, which is good that you're setting an example. Yeah, I do. Well, thank you. And again, I feel like it's an obligation. I've been so fortunate in my life. I've had, you know, some level of success. I've done some really cool things and, and I love to see other people win. I love to see other people experience some of the things that I've experienced. Uh, and I consider it kind of my job is to open doors, set examples. Uh, you know, I'm definitely not perfect in any way. I'm sure I'll fumble the ball a time or two, but I, I do think that People in positions of visibility have an obligation to set an example, or at least try and set an example. Again, I don't think I'm any perfect example, and I don't hold myself in that in that light, but I do take the position very seriously. Even thinking about being the first black CEO or being a black executive of any kind, there's a responsibility that goes along with that and a chance to 
maybe have somebody say, oh, that person looks like me or maybe came from where I come from. That's something that's aspirational to some and can give them hope or an opportunity to reach for that level of, of uh, I guess, success. You're an example. Yeah. So there was a, a chair, somewhat of like a charity effort that you were involved in with Music Cares. And during COVID-19, you were able to raise relief of uh, over $20 million, which is you know an incredible amount of money to raise to really help artists. Ben, you got to get you- the number way up way up we've raised 40 million dollars and given that money to people who need help during COVID, and it made such a difference to people in need and i did not do it by myself in fact steve boom who was the chair of music cares did so much work and laura segura did so much work Uh, i was part of a team that did that work but the academy is very proud of that and we continue to um, invest i'll say invest that money back into Mm -hmm. the music community to people who need help, whether that's a mental crisis or a health issue or somebody who just lost work because of COVID or another reason and and couldn't pay their bills. That's what Music Cares is for. And that's why when I talk about service, when I talk about the academy, why I love doing this work is because when somebody calls and said, man, I'm on hard times, I'm struggling, you don't have to be a member. You don't have to be a part of the academy. But if you're a music person and you you love and you care about your, your craft, we're here to help you. And so that's what we've done through Music Cares. And it makes me really happy. That's great. So just the last question that I have, you know, what do you want to accomplish now, whether it's professionally through being the CEO of, of the Grammys, of the Recording Academy, but personally as well, what are some of your short-term or long-term goals over the next five to 10 years? We don't have enough time left in the interview for you to hear my goals, I <laughs> promise you, because the list is long. I could touch on a couple of things. Personally, I want to continue to be of service to people. I want to continue to make people happy. I want to make my family and my wife proud. I want to make people that I work with uh, comfortable and confident in me as a leader and somebody that they all want to work with and somebody that they're proud to work with. So that's something I think about when I'm making a decision. How is my team going to feel about this? How are they going to react? Are they going to believe and get behind this and support it? So that's some of the goals that I I have for my work. Uh, I want to continue to evolve the academy as far as goals for for the Grammys. I see an opportunity to do more. You know, we touched on it earlier, but the platform that we have is a very, very powerful one and can be impactful, not just to the music community, but to to the world. So it sounds uh, maybe overly optimistic, but that's me. I'm I'm a glass half full, rose colored glasses guy. So I think we can do a lot of good with the academy and with music so continuing to expand our reach into other territories is something we've announced over the last few months i'm looking forward to that and having a goal of having you know other academies doing the work the mission work the service work the infrastructure building the supporting of music people not just in the u.s or latin america but in africa in the middle east and asia and in india other parts of the world they're making great music. I went to a concert, a Dilgit concert the other day at Crypto.com. There's 20,000 people that knew every word to every song from, from the artists from India. And I looked around and I said, you know, there's amazing artists everywhere and they all are coming from somewhere. How do we cultivate other music ecosystems and, and how do we support other creators so that we have other massive artists coming from other parts of the world? So that's a goal there. And then Personally, I want to continue to live a fulfilling life. I want to be happy. I want to be healthy. I want to spend time with my family. I have two amazing kids. I have a great wife. I have great staff and team that I work with. So spending time with them and cultivating those relationships. And, you know, Ben, I try and have fun. I don't know. A lot of people are in these positions. They get so caught up and they're so stressed and tense. And, yeah, it's a lot of hard work and there's a lot of decisions that are difficult. And sometimes you you do something that affects somebody negatively. but I want to minimize that and I want to do things that affect people positively and, and really use my time on the planet for for good and for lifting and for shining and for celebrating and for smiling and laughing. You know, that sounds corny, but that's uh that's my goal. Well, I think that it all sounds good. I'm definitely excited to see Harvey what you're gonna do next. I think you've already done a lot. Um, you know, in the time you've been leading the Grammys and throughout your career. I mean you've created some be- beautiful pieces of music that have had really good positive meaning as well. And Um, I look forward to the impact that you're going to continue to have. Thanks for coming on and doing this. Amazing. Good to be with you. And thank you.